nature produced synapses, very stable synapses. It is a system that is evolutionarily conserved. Yeah, it works every time. Um, evolution took a few millions of years, billion, you know, hundreds of millions of years to make it. So it's very robust. So there got to be um, a, a solution to the mystery. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If nature can do it, then we can redo it and re-engineer it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I think there's hope for that. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Neuroscience and Beyond podcast. I'm Svilin, a molecular and cellular neuroscience PhD student at the University Medical Center Göttingen in Germany. Alongside my colleague, Christina, we are on a quest to bring science, and especially neuroscience, closer to the general public. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Professor Valentin Neger, who leads the Synaptic Plasticity and Super Resolution Microscopy Lab at the Interdisciplinary Institute of Neuroscience in Bordeaux, France. His pioneering work delves into the intricate structures of our brains, particularly focusing on the synapse, the connection between two nerve cells that is fundamental for our memory. Leveraging cutting-edge microscopy tools, electrophysiology and computational models, his team explores the mysteries of synaptic function and brain plasticity. In this episode, you will learn not only about the synapse, but also where our memory is processed, what is the relation between sushi and microscopy, and why is the extracellular space in the brain so important, and also many other exciting topics. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that this podcast is separate activity from my position at the University Medical Center Göttingen in Germany. This podcast is supported by the International Max Planck Research School for Neurosciences, as well as the Cluster of Excellence Multiscale Bioimaging in Göttingen. If you want to support us, please subscribe to our channel and do not hesitate to drop us a comment under our videos. And now, dear listeners, please enjoy the talk with Professor Valentin Neger. Professor Neger, thank you for being here. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Great to be here. So yesterday you gave a fantastic lecture uh, in the Ring 4 Lesung series here in Göttingen. And you talked about synapses and also super resolution microscopy. We're going to discuss all of this uh, a little bit later. But I would like to know... Um, how did it start it for you? So as long as I remember, you have a training in um, medicine and physics, and at some point you switched to neuroscience. Is it possible to elaborate about the history behind your decision to do this? Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. So I started out um, studying physics and medicine in Göttingen originally, coming from a family of physicists. My father was actually a professor of physics in, in Göttingen, uh, doing biomechanics. And my, both of my older brothers were also studying physics. And so I've just followed like a little duck um, in, in that path. Um, but then soon I, um, or, or, at, or at the outset, I, I was interested in life sciences. And at the time, there were no um, combined studies. So you couldn't study neuroscience. Or you could just study biology, physics, or, or medicine. And then I combined both uh, to learn the medicine, which offers you know, a whole range of biological topics, but also the, the physics was important. And then, um, and then it came all a little bit too much. Uh, <laughs> to, and I, there was a chance for me to go to the US um, for, for a, a one year um, scholar, my one year scholarship. And there I fell in love with, um, with neuroscience um, and then stayed there actually, got an, uh, an extension, got a fellowship to, uh, for graduate studies and did my PhD over there. In which lab were um, you at? Uh, uh, Istvan Modi mm -hmm. is an electrophysiologist, neurophysiologist, mm -hmm. one of the first um, wave of, or one of the first scientists to apply the patch clamp technology, which was mm -hmm. developed here in Göttingen, mm -hmm. to uh, inhibitory um, synapses, inhibitory synaptic transmission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there I studied actually, um, in the lab studied mostly calcium um, homeostasis, calcium regulation, buffering of calcium by calcium binding proteins mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. using... Um, uh, high resolution optical approaches already. Mm. So it's like physiology and microscopy also combined. Yes. Yeah. 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 Was it on the east or the west coast? Yeah, uh, at uh, west coast at UCLA. UCLA. Yeah. Okay. So okay. this was. And then you, I remember you had also a, um, I think, postdoc in in München, right, in the Max Planck, and before you left and went to France, or mm. maybe there were also other stations. If you can mm. maybe yes. tell us about So this. then I graduated. Um, from UCLA in 2000, and then came back to, um, to Germany, wanted to join the lab of uh, Tobias Bonhoeffer, mm -hmm. who actually had uh, plans, potential plans to go to the US, he was um, in, in negotiations, and I would have gone there uh, mm -hmm. happily. 
Um, but then he stayed in, in Munich at the Max Planck in um, Max Planck of Neurobiology in Martin Street. So I, I joined him there to uh, continue on um, high high resolution microscopy applied to synapses uh, to dendritic spines, which was then my started to be my love for the rest of my career so far. Yeah. Mm-hmm. We're going to talk about the yeah. spines, guys, hold on, please. Uh-huh. But uh, I would just want to elaborate a little bit more and mm-hmm. gain a little bit more information about your history. And, and now you're a leading um, a lab in Bordeaux, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. How do you, what do you think about that? So you've been in a, in a various top-notch institutions around the globe, right? In your opinion, what makes an institute a world-class institute? Mm-hmm. What are the characteristics Yeah, it's uh, of course it takes a number of um, elements. Um, it, chiefly, of course, a good infrastructure, a good technical infrastructure, a good um, administrative support, and all, all of that. Yeah, it needs to be updated, needs to be sort of generously um, supplied, mm-hmm. but also a spirit needs to be there. I think mm-hmm. it needs to. Um, if it's just sort of technically perfect, that's that's not enough. Um, you need to have a like a yeah from the students, from the also promoted by the faculties, an enthusiasm for for science, a genuine interest, focus on on the science itself. Um, mm-hmm. And that's hard to, um, you, to to generate. You can't just order that. You need to have the right mix of people. Um, so there, there needs to be a, a long-term things. You cannot just generate it on, on you know, the press of a button. You mm-hmm. have to sort of have a culture that develops. Mm-hmm. Yeah? Mm-hmm. And um, so that I think that's the, the, these components, these elements are, are necessary. Um, And then, of course, there's, yeah, it needs the place if it, it helps, if it has a history um, to it yeah, that people can take sort of reference cues from. Um, from the past, from yeah. The, I, I know that Göttingen has a huge history in, in science, and physics, mathematics, also mm. neuroscience, thanks to Erwin Nair and mm. Walter Stümer and Hadjan, mm. many, many, many names were here. And they helped build the European Neuroscience Institute, which is just uh, down the corner and also established this this kind of a graduate school, the International Max mm. Planck Research School for Neurosciences, which I'm part of. And I would like to ask you, when, when you went to Bordeaux, was there some, some kind of, um, was this already established or you started slowly doing this? I, I know that there is a program now, like a house school for mm. neuroscience, which is also in Bordeaux and, and, and Portugal. How was it when you, when you went there mm. back then? Yeah, it, uh, Bordeaux was sort of, um, that was one of the attractions for me, it was sort of up and coming. Um, it had uh, just maybe 10 years before that, uh, before, before my, my joining, there had, very, had been very little in the way of neuroscience. Mm-hmm. But in the early 2000s, uh, it really started to pick up. Um, and then, um, and they, so I, I joined at a, at a really at a good moment when um, there's a, a few hires, a few recruits. Um, there's the, the region, um, so the Land, uh, Akiten, uh, was invested into the, in the promotion of, of basic research, particularly neuroscience in, in the area. So there was a, a few things coming together. And then um, this pushed um, science and also uh, teaching and, um, and, and training. And we set up these, these programs. Um, so the, a number of people who were really involved in this, Christoph Mühl, for instance, mm-hmm. um, was leading this um, Kahal School initiative and several other things that came together to um, put Bordeaux on the map scientifically and as a training site. And, mm-hmm. um, and that has developed and keeps on developing. So it's actually very nice in Bordeaux in that respect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And now you, you have been already for a couple of years there and you established your lab. I would like to ask you, what is the focus of your research? Mm-hmm. Yeah, my uh, f- lab f- uh, works on sort of the interface of method development. So we try to do serious method development in light microscopy, aka um, super resolution microscopy, mm-hmm. and then apply that to answer, tackle interesting challenges in neuroscience, particularly around revolving around synaptic functions, synaptic plasticity, um, getting a more a more precise view, a sharper view, more detailed view, more holistic view mm-hmm. of the functioning and malfunctioning of synapses mm-hmm, yeah. mm-hmm. and, and ulti- ultimately also networks. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Let's start by maybe dissecting this, this term synapse. What does it mean and why is it so important in neuroscience? I know that is one of the fundamental building blocks, for example, mm-hmm. of memory, 
maybe we can touch upon mm-hmm. this topic. But why is it so interesting to scientists to study this this organization in the brain? Yeah, I mean, for one thing, it's um, I think it's, it's exudes a lot of uh, f- uh, fascination because it's it's really as you said this building block where it's just this really where. Um, uh, molecular biology, bio- complicated biochemistry, uh, and so on, come together with um, what the brain does, what what its purpose is, and that is to compute information. Mm-hmm. To, and that is um, something sort of higher level. This, you know, it's it's inf- it's computer science, if you will. Yeah, information processing. It's mathematics, um, and it's really that's where these two different concepts meet. Yeah, there's really the molecular implementation, and then there's the higher logic of of you know, if, of making sense of information, extracting features in the surface of um, of running an organism that is capable of incredible things, yeah, mm-hmm. the, uh, f- footing our the function of our brain. So I think that's that's the everyone is fascinated by that. A lot of people. Then uh, a synapse is um, I find particularly beautiful morphologically. It's a amazing structure. If if there's it's for anything. It's it's also for for beauty. I think, yeah. Um, and then I think um, now realistically, people are interested in. That's why I think synaptic research is still so much funded. Um, although we you know we could say, oh, we know a lot about it already. We know how you know presynaptic and uh, release, and then postsynaptic response, and broadly we know all the players, and then that's good. Yeah, but I think it's we we want to know more about it to find. Um, to help synapses in in distress during disease, we hope to find new targets, molecular targets, drugs that can fix things. Yeah, and mm-hmm. that is, um, I think, possible even without knowing exactly how a synapse works and reconstructing it and rebuilding it uh, with micro engine and nano engineering or so, uh, which would be a, a proof that we really understand it. But we probably don't need to have that. Mm-hmm. We just need to be lucky to hit on some targets, some drugs. Mm-hmm. They can prove things. Yeah? Um, mm-hmm. I think there's examples and re- reasons to to hope that this may be possible. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Regarding to this, the, the the complexity is so enormous. So if we say that we have what 80, 100 billion neurons in our in our brain, and each of these cells, these neurons, they have plenty of synapses, thousands, maybe some of them tens of thousands, hundreds mm-hmm. of thousands. If we pick up the cerebellum in our brain, mm-hmm. and all of this. Synapses are filled with hundreds of thousands of proteins, which are mm. constantly mm. in turnover. And to know exactly the structure and interaction of all of these players is mm. maybe impossible right now. Mm. And as you said, we perhaps don't need to unlock um, the information about the whole complexity. But if we press the, the right buttons, we can understand mm. maybe how some disease uh, progress or how some um, other function in the brain occurs, mm. etc. However, we still study it and we are fascinated by it. And um, I think that is, as you said, very beautiful and from aesthetic uh, point of view and important to understand um, many, many aspects of it. When you study the synapse, this is a a morphological organization that is in a micrometer, nanometer range, right? It is hard to study it in humans, perhaps. Do you use any model organisms Mm. to do, to study it? Yes. Yeah. So we primarily use um, the mouse um, as a model system to study the mammalian brain, mm-hmm. um, also rodent, rat um, preparations. But um, yes, we we do have we try to have access to human uh, brain tissue, um, but it's yeah complicated to to get a hold of. Um, mm-hmm. So primarily mouse. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's also complicated to get into the brain of humans, right? Mm-hmm. This is also ethical, mm-hmm. not uh, correct, and many many aspects need to be <laughs> discussed in order some invasive technique to be applied mm-hmm. to humans. What kind of methods do you use to study this in, in mice and rats, for example? Yeah, so we use um, so-called reduced preparations. We use brain slices, mm-hmm. um, acu- either acute brain slices that we can maintain for a few hours on end um, mm-hmm. in, in sort of happy conditions, um, in good conditions, and we can record from them um, with very high resolution at the synaptic level, the events and the, the microstructures. 
or um, we use um, organotypic brain slices that have the advantage of um, the, uh, being um, maintained or maintainable longer in, in culture. We can mm -hmm. keep them in a, an incubator for, for weeks on end. Um, we can do repetitive manipulations, observations. And then increasingly we're using um, the intact brain in vivo or more or less intact brain in vivo using a, by now a very standard approach of using a cranial window to take a peek, literally take a peek into the inside of the brain mm -hmm. and apply the, the high resolution um, microscopy um, through that window. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, we can go to the high resolution microscopy in a minute, but I wanted to ask you, do you experience nowadays any problems in, in when you have to conduct animal experiments? As we know in Europe, there is this kind mm -hmm. of uh, initiative going on to shut down animal mm -hmm. experiments, which I think are crucial. Mm. especially for neuroscience. How is it in, 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 in France? In Germany, we struggle now a lot in order to get permissions. Do you experience similar things in your research? Um, overall, I think the, the regulations, I think, are pretty similar. Uh, I think they're European, mm -hmm. they're European issued. Europe issued. Um, um, in France, there is um, not a, a very vocal animal rights community. I mean, I have not, I mean, we've been warned a few times of some, some actions um, occurring maybe outside of the university or outside the institute, but I've never actually seen it. Um, doesn't seem to be a major hot button issue so much in, in France, maybe less than um, in Germany and certainly less than in the UK. Tierversuchsanträge, mm -hmm. um, animal rights, uh, animal um, experiment um, um, permissions are also quite tedious to come by, but it's possible. Mm -hmm. And you have to just um, fill out the, uh, the huge number of papers and so on, but it's not, it's not, um, it's, it's a burden, but it's, it's, I would say still doable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. what, what would be the, 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 let's say the in time frames, if you fill out the documents today, would you have a permission to do in vivo yeah. in a, in a, in a half year? Span? Half and a half year half span year. about, okay. that's okay. What, it, what it takes. And then it can be, also there's people um, typically at the Institute who, who sort of specialize on this, who know how to write, to write and what, what boxes to tick. So we have, um, sort of mutualize that, so there's a lot of experience. Um, so as a, as a PI, actually, I must say, I haven't had too much to worry about. Mm -hmm. um, but I understand that in Germany, it's the, the burden is, is much higher. Yeah. It's, now, it, yeah. as you said, the, it's for, for experimental science, for science in general, it's, it's crucial to do um, mm -hmm. animal experiments. Mm -hmm. yeah, we have to, um, and there's a lot of hypocrisy, of course, involved yeah, compared to the food industry. Um, it, there's, there's no comparison yeah? um, and for um, and people say also um, maybe that was a question you're going to ask me <laughs> but, um, but there is I mean there's a need uh, to do experiments we cannot just model things but mm -hmm. some people some proponents say we have mm -hmm. to um, we can do everything in silico and so on there, there's no need anymore for experimentation that but that's that's very foolish because um, we need to the experiments decide what, what is the truth. Yeah, we cannot model the the, the truth completely. Uh, mm -hmm. you very quickly, do you, there's an infinity of possibilities, and you need to do experiments. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's if you want to if we want to progress in science, well, we have to logically um, uh, permit um, animal experimentation. Yeah. Yeah, there are some efforts now with the development of artificial intelligence to, to kind of uh, screen a lot of possibilities and then um, maybe try experimentally mm. only some of them, which is mm. actually That's quite quite efficient. But I've heard already for failed, about failed experiments that were only in silico, so in the computer, mm. and they tried mm. to develop some drug, but at the end, it, of course, it failed the testing. Mm. Um, however, this is this is a completely other topic. But I'm happy mm. that at least in France, you still um, mm. kind of um, can work um, properly uh, without struggling with, with, with animal experiments permissions. If we go back to our lovely structure, the synapse, um, when you study, so you have these brain slices, um, do you study a particular brain region or you study it across the whole brain? And if we take it, um, so can we say that the synapse is similar in also in, in all brain regions or it is specific to particular regions in the brain? Mm. 
uh, for sure, it's well known that there's a large diversity in synapse types. Um, mm -hmm. We know there's lots of huge diversity in in cell types, neuronal types, and glial types, and certainly that is also there's a corresponding diversity in in synapse types across brain areas, even in, within brain areas, mm -hmm. um, very different synapses. Um, but then there's common features. There's sort of canonical synapses, believed to be canonical synapses, like the CA3, CA1, mm -hmm. excitatory synapse. Um, so there's um, you have to you have to benefit from that fact that there's some common core features, but then be attentive to the fact that there's there's different mechan you know different um, incarnations for sure. Mm -hmm. This um, canonical synapse that you mentioned in CA1, CA3 regions, these are in the hippocampus, mm -hmm. right? And this area has been um, very important in the study, especially in memory uh, and, and neuroscience throughout the years. Why, why is it so? Why, why is hippocampus so important in, in memory, mm -hmm. for example? Yes, um, so hippocampus has, been, has long been implicated in, in mnemonic memory functions um, based on famous experiments, for instance, um, HM, this patient, famous patient, um, I think Henry Molassen is mm -hmm. his name, long spelled out, um, who was um, an epileptic patient who, who found relief from, um, from epileptic seizures after a part of his hippocampus was removed, surgically removed. Yeah? But it had the, the tragic consequence that he basically lost his ability for short-term memory. He could remember old things, previous things stored back uh, back in the, earlier in his biography, but any new uh, information could not be encoded. And that gave a str very strong hint, mind you, anecdotally, that this region is, is crucial for memory processing. And that has been supported uh, before and after already by other clinical um, uh, points, um, insights, experiments. And then um, this was then... This field was then, um, or this idea was strengthened with a finding in, um, in, in rodent models, also rabbit originally actually, um, the rabbit brain of the discovery of synaptic potentiation. Mm -hmm. So the, um, uh, an electrophysiological functional correlate of how memory may be encoded. Um, and that then led people to, to study the hippocampus where this phenomenon was observed in greater, greater and greater detail. Um, and then, um, and then people could show that synapses in the hippocampus are particularly um, tuned to, um, or really um, prone to expressing uh, synaptic plasticity. So there, there was this major interest, and then uh, on top of that, um, turned out that the hippocampus is a very um, convenient st uh, structure to study. Mm -hmm. it's, um, even though it's deeply embedded in the brain, it can be cut out, it can be. You can produce, um, generate slices, brain slices out of it. You can cultivate them. Um, it's also not impossible to reach it um, um, under intact brain conditions yeah, with electrodes from, from afar, now even optically. Um, and then it has a, um, a nice, um, uh, let's say, a nice anatomical organization. It's very structured. Um, it's not salt and pepper like in the, in the cortex. It's really a, a very beautiful arrangement of of, of cell types, uh, very orderly, um, very laminar, yeah, um, that makes the, um, the, um, the interpretation also of the results, the, uh, the recordings, the electrophysiological recordings, um, much easier yeah, um, because of the sort of the, 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 the physics of the, the, uh, the, um, the electrical features, sort of, if you will, of the, the fields. Um, and that, that also promoted the, the, the use of this preparation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, you uh, mentioned the term synaptic plasticity. Can you maybe inform us about the relation between this term, synaptic plasticity, mm. also the hippocampus and, and memory, for example? Mm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, synaptic plasticity um, refers to the phenomenon of, um, of a, uh, some change um, in the function, ultimately, of the synapse and, and its ability to carry information from one cell to another in a, in a, in a sp under specific circumstances to reroute then effectively the electrical activity that runs through a, um, that curves through a circuit. And that is, um, 
yeah, the term itself, synaptic plasticity synapse, refers to the synapse, and plasticity is a term borrowed from from mechanics or from physics, where um, it, it refers to a plastic change, some permanent change or some change that outlasts the, the stimulus. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, and that's what, what you would want in a memory device, something that that remembers something that is, is a, has some, um, some, some realization, some correlate of, of um, some stimulus, um, and that then this change persists and can be read out at some future point. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in this, um, this malleability, um, this plasticity was first documented in the hippocampus uh, to be really present there in a pro pronounced way. And, um, and then, you know, this is in the hippocampus where all these, again, um, where all these clinical observations had indicated that this is really crucial for, for memory processing. Mm -hmm. And maybe we can just briefly mention and don't go deeply, but the hippocampus is responsible, let's say, for certain type of memory, then this mm -hmm. memory are perhaps transferred to other brain regions, such as the cortex, mm -hmm. as in the case of HM, who had mm -hmm. already his memory stored somewhere, not in the hippocampus. Mm -hmm. And this uh, topic is also a very, very um, intense research field in, in neuroscience and also very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we know what is the hippocampus, um, more or less the synapse, and um, the relation to plasticity, what is plasticity in relation to, to memory, and um, also we are fascinated by the structure of synapses. But what is there still to learn? What, what do you want to, um, what kind of question do you want to answer with your research, for example, studying mm -hmm. the synapse? Yeah, so I think we can go... Um uh, much further in the in the way we've already gone um, the last hundred years about you know when the synapse was basically first characterized the days of Mani Cajal and um, Valdaya and um, Sherrington and so on um, we now have we've come, come we've hit upon um, this uh, technological wonderland yeah, uh, where we can know, we know we can learn so much more even though we know it's not going to be enough. Yeah, even you know, so with today's technology we can there's a huge sort of headroom in terms of what we can learn but we we also know at the same time the technology needs to improve much more yeah As we said there's in the synapse there's thousands of proteins um and and, and we, one would want to monitor them i mean with our paradigm now right of how we understand things we would want to monitor the positions of all of the molecules right um and we have to go into all this detail, perhaps, right? There's not, unless there's some overarching um, unifying theory that, um, that, you know, is then, is a sort of a way to simplify everything magically, yeah? Mm -hmm. But barring that, we'd want to follow all the proteins around and the proteins can exist in, in different conformational states, yeah? They can, they can harbor, uh, carry all kinds of different information, yeah? So that seems impossible now, yeah? With, certainly with our, our technique, our fluorescence microscopy approach, where we can label three proteins at the same time, you know, um, we are hopelessly under-motorized. Yeah? Mm -hmm. But relative to, you know, our previous um, work, you know, stuff, work from, from in the last century, you now we have amazing um, technological capabilities. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So I think we need to ex apply them to the best of our ability, improve the methods along the way. Um, and then we, Keep on, keep on going, yeah. And and then the the, the hope is that there is, um, yeah, something, some unifying theory will 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 develop, and it's not just details and details and details, and we just get lost in the in the in mm -hmm. the infinity of, of possibility. Yeah, um, but I'm, I think, I mean, nature uh, produced synapses, very stable synapses. It's a system that is evolutionarily conserved. Yeah, it works every time. Um, Evolution took a few millions of years, you know, hundreds of millions of years to make it. So it's very robust. So there got to be um, a, a solution to the mystery. Yeah? Mm -hmm. If nature can do it, then we can redo it and re-engineer it. Mm -hmm. So I think there's hope for that. Yeah, yeah there is hope. And um, also, as you said, this technological advancement nowadays, it, it, it helps us expand our um, or broaden our perspectives and 
investigate many problems from different sides and gain a lot of knowledge. Interestingly, a lot of things that I read about neuroscience, they were all discovered by Ramonica High mm -hmm. only with a pen and a simple microscope. Mm -hmm. And now we have such a huge advancement in, in microscopy, for example, and we can study so many details and it's just amazing the time that we live in. <laughs> I'm very grateful that I am able to do my PhD nowadays and be able to play with some of the instruments and perhaps discover something interesting, who knows. Speaking of instruments, you are working heavily with super resolution microscopy. If it's possible, maybe we can briefly explain what super resolution microscopy is and what kind of methods do you use mm. to study yeah. the synapse? Yes, so um, we use primarily um, uh, super resolution stat microscopy. Um, we use that also in combination with other uh, super resolution modalities, but the main technique for, for good reason is a stat microscopy, which we apply um, in vivo you know, through, through a cranial window. Um, and there, the method of choice really now is, um, when it comes to super resolution microscopy, is stat microscopy. Yeah? Stat microscopy, I can explain that a little bit briefly. Uh, of course, uh, Derive or originates from from Göttingen, so just from nearby here, um, and it's um, yeah, the first uh, viable concept and then technology that overcame the diffraction barrier of light microscopy. Yeah. You know from high school physics that a classic, a normal light microscope is limited in its ability to resolve very small structures to around half a micron or so, so 500 nanometers of the visible. Um, wavelength of light um, and th this um, this concept of stat microscopy in principle uh, shattered this limit um, shattered the the limiting effect of uh, diffraction beugung in, in German um, that set um, this constraint uh, this half a micron constraint yeah? and the way it works it, fun it fundamentally um, it puts the um, the the agent that makes things visible, the, the fluorophore, the GFP molecule or the organic dye, puts that sort of center stage and plays with that in the sense that there is um, it's a realization, it was a realization, it was a genius uh, insight of uh, Stefan Hell. There's an on state and off state, and you can manipulate both. And this is this transition, if you will, is call it non, very nonlinear. It's either off or on. And um, by playing, by uh, sort of feeding these two states, you can um, effectively uh, reduce the size of the, the uh, activation area of your fluorescence, in, this case, in the case of a fluorescence microscope, to a spot that is much smaller than, than what's prescribed by the diffraction limit. Yeah? Um, so sp specifically or concretely in a STET microscope, you have a, an excitation laser, sp produces a small diffraction limited spot. Yeah? And, um, and then you superimpose a second laser, which does exactly the opposite, which de-excites the fluorescence, it prohibits the fluorescence everywhere except for in a small um, central region. And then if you overlay the two together, you, get, you end up with a, an excitation spot that's greatly reduced in size. And then you use that to scan the sample in a, in a classic a classic way, like in a confocal or regular two-photon microscope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is a great advancement and great achievement. Stefan Hale was awarded a Nobel Prize for this with several mm -hmm. other scientists. However, I have this question regarding the, the damage that you induce to the, to the mm -hmm. cell. So as you mentioned, these are strong lasers that need to be applied in order to excite the certain fluorophore molecule, fluorescent molecule. And then you hit this this spot with another uh, laser that is even stronger. Mm. Um, what kind of damage do you induce w mm. when you when you do this? And um, to what extent um, can you do live imaging? I, I mean, how long can you maintain mm. this, this? This yes, uh, yeah. So that's it's uh, um, a good point. Uh, in general, fluorescence microscopy has the has the um, disadvantage. Or the there's a concern that you need to um, provide a, quite a bit of light energy to excite the, the fluorophore. And in the process, you may actually damage the fluorophore, so you may uh, degrade the system, the very system that you're using um, to, to uh, get your information. Yeah? But even more gravely, the light that you're using may damage the biological structures that you're 
trying to observe. Yeah, I mean, certainly in electron microscopy, it's um, much much worse the situation because they are uh, you're making mechanical sections and you're fixing things and so on. Right, so all life processes are um, arrested, anyways. But also in light microscopy, you may be subtly changing things, and you don't really never you never you may not know really when things are still okay. They seem, but may you may have tweaked the system. Um, in, in a bad way, um, and so in this is um, confocal microscopy can be quite severe. Yeah, you have a small spot, intense light, in the effort to get higher spatial resolution. You don't do, do wide field imaging; you produce a small spot, but then you don't want to sacrifice temporal resolution. So you increase the laser intensity to really scan rapidly across the sample, right, to get enough photons out in a per unit of time and per pixel. But then you may induce damage, right? Mm -hmm. And then to make matters worse, in state microscopy, you add, as you mentioned, another laser beam that, in in fact, has um, more than a thousand is more, uh, more than a thousand times as intense. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So typically, in confocal microscopy, you use laser intensities of around absolute intensities of around a few microwatts. Mm -hmm. In state microscopy, you add another laser that has milliwatts. Yeah. Um, so that's certainly is a matter, should be a matter of concern, and it is, yeah, and it is a it is a problem. Um, and you have there's some practical workarounds. There's ways to optimize the acquisition parameters to um, not overdo it. Yeah, to stay b below the sort of the damage threshold of the tissue of the cells. Um, and then there's different ways of labeling yeah, that that help to circumvent the problem. Um, and and also there's a general. Um, uh, important thing to consider is also the wavelength. Where you um, s um, measure, where you, which la laser wavelengths you use, actually matters a lot for the damage you may inflict. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So if there's some windows that are um, more innocuous, or so spectral windows that are more innocuous, some uh, uh, wavelengths are extremely toxic or extremely damaging, especially if you're, so this concerns two photon microscopy, if you're sitting on a, on a um, water absorption line around nine, 10, I think, I believe, yeah, around 900. So there you may be um, um, driving the, um, you know, the, the heating of the tissue because the water absorbs the, the infrared light. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are some wavelengths that are okay, others you have really have to be uh, careful about. So, so we say that a little bit more red-shifted wavelengths, they're better uh, as, a, as, a remember, in, in, right? as a In As a general rule, yes, yes. The, the, the redder, the better. Um, <laughs> and there's an um, infrared window um, Mm -hmm. Where the brain also becomes less um, absorbs less, scatters less. Yeah? In general, longer wavelengths show less rally scattering, um, so you can deliver the light um, into the tissue more deeply and still maintain a good focus. Yeah? So there's a, a few um, benefits to going into the red range. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So for the people who are not that familiar and do not remember from the school, as you as you as you might know or not know, we, we see in a certain range of light from roughly 400 to roughly 700 mm -hmm. nanometers and uh, these are the wavelengths that we were just discussing right now mm -hmm. and we are they are used also in microscopy in light microscopy and the the, the shorter the wavelength the, the higher energy it has and mm -hmm. the longer the wavelength the the, the less mm -hmm. energy it possesses. Yeah. Right? in the extreme very short wavelengths the light becomes ionizing and then that's of course highly damaging mm -hmm. The, ben the benefit of short wavelengths are it's, um, it's short wavelengths, unless they are like X-ray, but um, uh, visible short wavelengths can be still bent by, um, by lenses, yeah, by glass. Um, so you can have a nice focus. You're using shorter wavelengths, which gives you a priori higher spatial resolution. So there's, mm -hmm. a, there's an incentive to work with short wavelengths, but then it's a problem that short wavelengths do more damage, scatter more, excite more autofluorescence, infrared wavelengths, um, penetrate more deeply and now we can use with two photon and even three photon mm -hmm. which is on the on the horizon we can go to very long wavelengths into beyond the micron mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now there's also ultrasound but these are mm -hmm. different uh, aspects and we are not going to discuss mm -hmm. the two photon mm -hmm. three photon mm -hmm. uh, microscopes they're completely different topic but uh, when you when you perform one experiment for how long can you maintain the mm -hmm. animal alive when you image for example mm -hmm. and gain information out of it using stet Yes. Yeah, so with a um, the, uh, with an uh, with a live animal, we can um, repeatedly image uh, the the animal. Um, we can put it under the microscope, have for an in, uh, for a imaging session, and then put it back into the cage and revisit for 
for as long as we we want, uh, mm -hmm. um, as long as the the surgery was done right, the anesthesia was done right, and there's no infection and so on. Uh, and um, but that's we've learned the skills. So mm -hmm. it can um, now certainly with the brain slice you cannot do that. Yeah, there's a um, there's a limited lifetime to it, especially with acute brain slices. Usually it's just good for for a day of experimentation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And because you have this, it's called cranial window, basically a glass. On, on top of, so basically the scope is open, right? And mm. there is a glass and you can image exactly where you imaged before and you can follow mm. the dynamic of certain signals, for example, right? Mm. Yes, it yeah. is possible to, yeah, having, um, I mean, it take, that takes some skills, um, but to find exact same area, find exact same neuron, the same stretch of dendrite, even synapse, mm -hmm. um, across different imaging sessions, across days or weeks. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you perform these experiments, can you, so are the animals um, awake? Do they behave? Mm -hmm. um, can you, for example, couple some functioning information, let's say visual mm -hmm. inputs with um, um, some changes in the, in the synaptic mm -hmm. scale, yeah. for example? In, uh, so far in our case, um, we, are, you, um, we are anesthetizing the animal that has the, has the benefit that they are a bit more stable, more calm. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, um, important for our super resolution microscopy where it's especially sensitive to to brain any kind of uh, motion artifacts yeah but um in the field now people uh, routinely use um awake behaving animals the head head fixed so their their head is magnetically or otherwise bolted to the if you will to the, to the objective um the microscope and then the animals are fully awake and they can react to visual stimuli or olfactory or tactile stimuli um, we're not there yet for the time being, but I don't um, anticipate major problems to to do that. Yeah, now the field is even advancing to um, to non head fixed um, animals um, having miniature microscopes uh, bolted onto the onto this cranial window microscopes that weigh on the order of just a few grams, yeah. mm -hmm. and then the animals can really run around freely, which is um, the most natural way, of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this is sort incredible, species, yeah. incredible for mm -hmm. acquiring data from 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 the structural changes in the brain, then maybe the electrical activity, mm -hmm. and you can observe the behavior. Here, mm -hmm. DPZ uh, Professor Guy has uh, this wonderful setup where he can implant um, chips in the monkey's brain, mm -hmm. and they can freely behave in a certain setup, and mm -hmm. they observed by. 29 cameras, I think, and they can correlate the brain activity with the behavior, mm -hmm. which is an uh, incredible achievement. And um, so you, you use this STET microscopy, mm -hmm. right, technique, but also you have developed a new approach of imaging, and it's called SUSHI. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe elaborate what the abbreviation means mm -hmm. and how, what do you use it for, this, this technique? Yes, um, so it's... Uh, uh, SUSHI stands for um, Super Resolution Shadow Imaging, and it uh, refers to um, the approach of uh, imaging with, a with an inverted contrast. The idea is not to um, label the structures, the cellular structures from the inside, but rather label them from the outside, um, which blocks you from obviously seeing anything on the inside, because um, you, you have no contrast inside of the cells. Um, but um, if you're interested only in in the morphology of the anatomy of the of the system of the of the tissue, then this is, I would say, a much superior strategy because um, it saves you this very invasive step of putting a dye into a cell, either mechanically or or um, by uh, genetic engineering. Um, it's very very easy to to be applied, and it's. Um, Gives you still provides you the, with the same contrast in theory, yeah? um, even better because you are um, you're labeling only a minority of the space. Yeah? It's sort of more economic um, in in the sense of um, giving background noise and so on. It's better than um, labeling the majority of the space. Yeah? You label a minority, yet you get um, as a contrast that is um, as high or even even higher, yeah? mm -hmm. and then it has the benefit of seeing um, not just one cell or a few cells that you're labeling, um, you happen to label, but um, you see the contours, through the contours, you see all of the cells. And you're not, with sufficient resolution, this is where super resolution came in, um, you're not missing any 
detail, any morphological detail of the of the, of the brain tissue, um, and you can um, sort of get a comprehensive view um, very easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how do you how do you label your cells? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or so the the, or we label the tissue. The, or practically, we label the interstitial fluid, the the, um, the cerebrospinal uh, liquor, um, with with a with a fluorescent dye. Um, we inject it either into the tissue, we inject it into if it's in vivo, we inject it into one of the the ventricles, the lateral ventricle, from where it spreads rapidly throughout the brain, and provides then sufficient contrast to see the the cells um, in an inverted way, and um, Because um, when that when it's um, um, when the when the image the images are then re acquired with a stet microscope and a, a very nicely uh, aligned and 3D stet microscope, we have we have the chance to actually reach the anatomical ground truth. Yeah, we can really resolve all the structures, um, the anatomical structures, mind you, not the molecular structures. We are far from from the molecular ground truth, but in terms of anatomy, we can see all that there is yeah there's not so if we don't see something that's meaningful that means it's not there it's not just that it's not labeled it's really not there yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that gives us a new a new access into yeah, the the complexity of the the system and as we can do this in in a live setting we can see the dynamics yeah? and then the you know so it's complexity nanoscale dynamics and that's that's very cool yeah Mm -hmm. I would like to satisfy my interest and maybe the, the topic will be a little bit more advanced, but um, excuse me for this curiosity. So when you inject this dye, where does it bind? Does it mm -hmm. stay in the in the liquid, in the cerebrospinal liquid, or does it bind the, something in the extracellular space, maybe the extracellular matrix? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, that depends on the dye. Um, there are some, some dyes that, are, um, that appear to be completely non-sticky, And they just diffuse um, around. They follow um, diffusion simply. Um, then any hydrostatic pressures or you know convection that that make them err around the the extracellular space. They they don't. The, these molecules don't get taken up uh, specifically by the by the by the cells. Yeah. Over time they do because cells are uh, endocytic in nature. Um, neurons for you know. Synaptic terminals, for instance, and many other places, right? Um, but uh, a priori, they um, they stay um, in the extracellular space and freely diffusible. Now, you could also use other dyes, other molecules attached to some functional groups that then specifically are sticky to some groups, some, for instance, ester groups in the in the extracellular matrix, and that has um, then the advantage, um, if you if you care so. To label as specific aspects of the extracellular matrix, yeah, mm -hmm. which we don't know a whole lot about, um, and um, and this is a, a way to um, to explore that that compartment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm studying in personal mm. the extracellular mm. matrix, therefore I'm I'm curious about it, and um, soon we are going to start hopefully developing, if we're lucky, some some tools to label some mm. molecules specifically. Mm. But let's see, there is uh, still an early development. Um, however, when you when you inject this dye, as you said, um, some of the cells might take it up depending on the dye, mm -hmm. but um, it might be also um, washed away. Mm -hmm. So you maybe have a particular time window where you can already um, only image at this time window. Is this, mm -hmm. is this true? Or yes. Or yeah. So the the brain has a has a way of um, of clearing. Um, itself of, of, of debris and um, in the brain liquor is being turned over um, a few times per day. Yeah? Um, so the, any, any dye molecules, we've seen that um, washes out qu pretty quickly. Um, so you have to resupply it. Um, you can do that with uh, um, you know, re-injections, re physical re-injections, or maybe a, a more a better way is using a cannula to have, sort of have a constant flow of, uh, of, um, of labeled Uh, uh, liquor joining the, the the rest of the uh, cerebrospinal fluid. Um, there's also uh, potentially, but this is also still in in in, in development stage. Uh, genetically, um, genetic strategies to label the extracellular space, much like we use genetic strategies to and express um, GFP or YFP, or also inside of cells cytosolically to to image to visualize their morphology. We can have 
we can come up with genetic strategies to label the exoscalar space. Mm -hmm. yeah? And then this saves us from the, the step, the um, a bit tedious, but also especially in, uh, invasive step mm -hmm. of having to label it physically yeah, from mm -hmm. the outside. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and when you label this so-called, so just to clarify once again, we have in the brain a lot of cells, so mainly neurons and glia, these supporting cells that are also like blood vessels that are very, very tight together and um, sit together. However, we have this extracellular space, which is amounts of about 20, 30% mm -hmm. of the brain volume. And we are talking about this space where mm -hmm. the extracellular matrix, so molecules around uh, this, this neuron or glia are situated and now in case you succeed in um, developing let's say these genetic tools to manage uh, to, to label the extracellular space so perhaps these labels will stay there for a longer time which will mm. allow you to perform also other experiments correct mm -hmm. yeah, yes yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe again a question of curiosity what kind of type of molecules would you like to label the hyaluronic acid maybe or some of the other Constituents. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think the first interest would be hyaluronic acid, mm. although we know quite a bit about hyaluronic acid or, already. But it's a f fascinating molecule. It has all these um, can be um, yeah, can be yeah, synthesized very rapidly. Yeah, can be uh, dissolved, can fall apart apparently within um, uh, you know, just a few seconds. Yeah, it's it's very a nice tropic in shape. It's a so this tentacles uh, can be really, really long, microns long, but just um, a single molecule chain, uh, this, this um, polymer, the sugar polymer. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, as such, it is um, has these biophysical properties where it's you know, osmotically active, mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, it can bind, char you know, it's charged, um, it can do a lot of, can affect the, yeah, the chemical and physical properties of the cells that are surrounded by it in a, in a, in a dramatic way. Yeah? And there's some evidence for that already, um, but it's mostly theoretical. Yeah? Um, and it would be um, very interesting to be able to f visualize and also manipulate it in a, in a really good way um, and, and, and tie that, correlate that with then specific functions, the excitability of the, 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 the network, the local network, synaptic function, plasticity, yeah? mm -hmm. um, and but then there are other other molecules. There are other proteins. Um, the the class of molecules in the extracellular space yeah, is not, or the extracellular matrix are not as well known. We don't know how to um, manipulate them as well. Yeah, um, I mean, we know how to deal with proteins very well, but sugar molecules we cannot. Mm -hmm. we, it's only indirect way to mm -hmm. to manipulate them, right? Because um, we cannot express a, a sugar molecule directly mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with genetic strategies. So okay. it's, a, it's a slightly different game and we have to get tuned to this now, but I don't think there's um, huge technical barriers. We just have to, have to turn our attention to it now. Yeah. Exactly, invest a little bit more time, yeah. energy, effort. And yeah, mm -hmm. there are this, um, as you mentioned, this nicely sugar polymers, the mm -hmm. hyaluronic acid, and but also these proteoglycans mm -hmm. or glycoproteins, which mm -hmm. are basically proteins with sugar chains and some mm -hmm. of them have other modifications and it's it's very complex but also interesting and mm. uh, extremely unexplored field mm. right and mm. yeah so it's a, t a kind of um, extracellular cytoskeleton mm -hmm. that is uh, hugely plastic and dynamic um, but we know very very little about it compared mm. to the intracellular uh, mm -hmm. cytoskeleton mm -hmm. yeah. it's very interesting because a lot of these molecules in the extracellular matrix they're extremely long lived they have mm. half lives of of days in, mm. in a mice, right? Mm -hmm. Which is a lot. And however, you have this dynamics in the, on the synapse morphology. Mm. And there are some hypotheses also from our lab, how this is, uh, uh, how this fits to, to dynamics and the stability of the molecules so that they are not um, cleaved and synthesized mm. in over, but some recycling is perhaps happening. However, this is a topic for another discussion. So now you have um, very nice methods and tools in your hands, right? You have a um, sushi microscopy and you also have STAT. Um, would you like to focus your research now on more on the, on the health and physiology of, of, of uh, nervous system or do you um, approach it from some disease aspect? Mm. Um, I think 
Um, I would go both in both directions. I think we fundamentally we, we should find out more about the sort of the healthy state to, to really um, understand the pathological um, deviations. Um, I think it already, um, without jumping the gun, I think it makes sense to, um, to explore some uh, interesting disease models, um, for instance, for Alzheimer's or, um, or stroke, yeah, and see how particularly the exocellular space is, is uh, deranged. Yeah, um, um, what it, you know, describe first off the phenomenology, how does the exocellular space change, yeah, um, um, the sort of the hydrodynamics, yeah, the, um, the, there's this idea of this lymphatic systems idea, yeah, how is that impacted in, in various um, diseases? Is that, could that be a, um, yeah, a, a cause, a motor for um, the accumulation of certain toxic uh, substances yeah, of, of certain plaques, for instance, uh, in, in Alzheimer's disease? Um, yeah, what is the role for of the extracellular space really in, in, in clearance? Yeah, there's mm -hmm. um, a lot of work already in that direction, but it's uh, also a very indirect. Yeah, if we, now that we can visualize extracellular space and really um, geometrically measure it, um, I think it's it's worth to take a take a closer look there. Yeah, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm keen on learning more about your your research since it's very close to mm. what I'm doing, or at least a little mm -hmm. bit close, mm -hmm. and it's very fascinating. This this extracellular space matrix is like the dark matter, right? It's mm -hmm. there, but it's understudied, and it's very 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 interesting. So, we talked a lot about. Um, microscopy, your research, and fascinating things in, in neuroscience and brains. And now towards um, the, the, the third part of our, our podcast, um, we would like to um, have your opinion on some of the problems in our field mm -hmm. or challenges, mm -hmm. uh, how, how people name it. And we always try to um, discuss several of them, like, uh, for example, the publishing, that there is some kind of a, a vicious circle that you need to publish fast in order to get a grant, in order to publish again, and um, also the reviews, the peer reviews, and the editors in some of the journals. These are there are some burdens in this process. Let's put it that way, and um, the funding per se is challenging for for science. Um, next to this, we have um, the reproducibility, meaning that um, in, in our field, very often people do some experiments, however, they cannot be reproduced and or it's quite challenging to do to, to, to obtain the similar results. Um, and of course, we have um, this kind of a challenge that a lot of people who are very well trained um, as a PhDs, they decide to leave academia and they go to, to the industry, which is completely valid, um, I think. However, um, maybe in the future we will have this kind of a lack of professionals who can be the next leaders, for example. Maybe if you can pick on some of these aspects mm. or maybe mention something else. Mm. And I would like to hear your opinion. Um, what could be changed and how, for mm. example? Yeah, so there's, yeah, you raise a number of points. Um, maybe start out with your yeah, data, this data reproducibility challenge mm -hmm. or concern, um, which um, I think is Part of it we have to embrace because we are in a we're working on something that's uh, very um, variable and uh, prone to um, artifacts um, and um, you know it's something very fragile, fleeting, and so. Um, so a lot of the um, the um, you know there are no standard conditions, um, and uh, a lot of the the, the effects phenomenology we observe um, even with you know with a lot of care and so on. It's just not reproducible because these conditions are different, you know, slightly different. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, so we have to accept that. Um, and then um, just with over time, we figure out standard conditions and then the, the reproducibility and in, increases. Yeah? Um, now, also, but then standard conditions may also, it's a bit of a, um, in, um, in contrast to in you know, biology, there is may also no standard conditions. You know? It's just the, the diversity of life, of the conditions and so on are, are different, so we have to factor that in. Yeah? So we have to be tolerant that it's just the results are not neat, can be put into neat boxes and bins and so on. Yeah, um, 
Now there's, there's a whole different issue of um, of um, you know poor shoddy data, uh, sh shoddy experiments, poorly designed ex experiments, not poorly or poorly controlled experiments, all of that. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So that's we have to just um, be mindful of that and and re re avoid that because it's really um, it's not lethal for science yeah because science will the, the better the correct science the true good science will progress and the, the shoddy science will fall by the wayside by definition yeah, yeah. Uh, in, inevitably because that's if it's not if it's poor no one will pick up on it right? maybe for a while but then it'll fall it'll it'll be forgotten um, but it's it's a huge drag on things a huge drag on resources it's also um um De, you know, demoralizing um, when people uh, do bad science, yeah, and uh, let alone you know do unethical stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if they really cheat, oh, that's that's not that's bad in in every activity, every human activity. Yeah, we don't um, uh, appreciate uh, cheaters, um, and they are um, you know it's not lethal, again it's not lethal for science, but it slows down the process. Yeah, and um, so. I think there's a way we have ways to, you know, science has developed ways to uh, minimize that, you know, and, and enlighten people and lead them also on a, on a more productive path. Um, and we, you know, as a scientific uh, enterprise always imp tries to improve um, our game, yeah? get better, get more precise, get more um, reliable. And, and there, um, it, there won't be a point where we re reached it finally. No, it's, it's a, it's a work in progress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have to, accept this um this this problem it'll, it'll be there forever yeah but it's it's okay <laughs> so that's the I issue of scientific you know uh, reprodu reproducibility then the the scientific uh, publishing uh, model i think they're we're experiencing a, a great change now yeah from the standard model of um, a few journals that kind of control everything at, at high prices mind you yeah um and now to a much more uh, transparent system um, with p peer review, open peer review, um, um, open, open access, and so on. Yeah, so I think that's overall very exciting and enriching. Um, I don't think there's um, there's one way forward. I think we should have permit um, be open to different models, um, including the, this old model of having um, you know uh, this sort of powerful editor who can decide things um, and make or break careers. I think that still there's some, some worth to that as well. I think the overall the, the exclusive and high quality peer review is, is important. Uh, they add value to the system, but I think there's, but also bioarchive modeling I think is great, fantastic, yeah? getting direct access to the raw data. Yeah? Um, overall uh, now, um, you know, all the share, data sharing is, uh, in a way, uh, is 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 re, you know overwhelming a bit. But on the other hand, that's exactly what we want to do. Yeah, we want to be able to to mine other people's data. Yeah, and see how, it, in terms of data repos reproducibility, also, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, use theirs. Yeah, and match it with ours and so on. So I think it's it's. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty now. We don't know where how how this is going to pan out, but it's, it's exciting times, and it's I think there are a lot of chances there right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're rather optimistic on these mm -hmm. two 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 mm -hmm. aspects. What about um, the work life balance? You mm -hmm. know, there are so many young individuals that are entering PhDs, and for me personally, this is um, um, kind of a, a question that you need to address for yourself. Okay, how much am I able to? To, to be stress resistant, let's say, and to work how much, uh, how many hours am I able to put in without suffering, uh, without having harm on my, on my health, etc. But there are also this kind of um, PIs, maybe from the older generation that push you to work harder and harder and harder. And also the PhD students I see from a lot of them kind of, they lack this ability to stand up and say, hey, of course, I will work, but I need to take a break here and there. And I think there is kind of a miscommunication between how much effort you need to put in and how much effort is required. How do you see this um, this this work life balance? Mm. Uh, a lot of people now address this 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 question. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it's um, um, of course important to be um, uh, a productive scientist. You have to be happy in your skin, and you have to have a good balance. Um, so you have to strike a good balance. Um, in, in science, I don't think you, 
necessarily not sh sure you work so much harder than in other areas. I think other uh, fields um, of other uh, professions, you also have to, you know, if there's something competitive, well, you have to stay ahead and then work, work hard and so on, work late hours and be, and think about your, uh, your, your stuff uh, a lot. Um, so yeah, I think in just what it takes in science is a bit, um, um, you have to be, um, tolerate um, uncertainty. Um, I mean, th that's the nature of the, the of study. Yeah, we don't know the answer and that's, you have to be excited about uncertainty and then figuring out a way, you know, okay, that's how it is. Yeah, it's, there's an, 99 ways that are wrong and, but there's, there's one way that work goes, goes through. Yeah? And then finding that, um, and enjoying to to find that path, yeah, the, the Aufstieg, and and identify where exactly it is, yeah, um, and then um, and then yeah, and also for your career path, there's a lot of quite a bit of uncertainty until you land a you know more permanent position, um, a position with a longer term perspective that can be can take quite a while, right, um, and it may not be in exactly in your town, in your area of your choosing of your origin. You may have to go, you know, outside of maybe um, outside of the, the, your country, outside of your, your continent. Um, so yeah, you have to be a little bit fl flexible there. Um, and, 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 but what, if you are, I think there's tons of opportunities now. Yeah, there's, I mean, it's so exciting, as you said, um, in this day and age, um, it's, you know, it's so amazing to do science. Yeah, it's, we are really at the, at the dawn of at the beginning of science now. Yeah. Um, the technology age is just starting off now. And if we, we can be part of this, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but in, in terms of yeah, coming back to work life, I think the um, balance and there's ways now, I mean, there's interest to, to uh, recruit good people, um, excellent people. Um, so science has, has to keep up with other fields and make this still in it. Um, attractive yeah? and that people don't just drop out because the job uncertainty is so high, um, salaries are not competitive and so on, yeah? or other, other aspects are not satisfying. So science better you know, work hard on, on yeah, offering young, the next generation, you know, attractive, um, attractive options, but it has to be realistic. I mean, you cannot be dreamlike conditions, yeah? but um, certainly um, you know, there needs to be like um, you know, good healthcare, good you know, good uh, uh, childcare programs, and, and all of that. Yeah, um, there needs to be a social dimension to things. Yeah, and 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 the the good places, the good institutions usually are, are you know are, are pushing that, are advancing that yeah, in the interest of keeping science attractive to people. And right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it, it should be, it should be that mm -hmm. way. And I think we need to invest even more in in, in science and try to figure out how to allocate uh, the fundings in a better way so mm. that I don't know how but uh, to exclude these uh, individuals who are dealing with uh, manipulating data or doing bad science it is very hard to do that perhaps mm. but uh, maybe some effort can be can be put in and I don't know these things can be better done who knows but um, maybe towards the end of our, our podcast episode, uh, I would like to ask you the following. So we were, we talked about this kind of advancement of technology and computer science and microscopy and many other aspects. How would you imagine, what, how would you want to see the field of neuroscience developing in the next five, 10 years, for example? What is for you something that you would say, wow, this, this can be achieved now with the current technology? Mm. Yeah, it is. I think the. I think now we're, we're all very um, excited about to read about and start to dabble in it. Um, is the, the 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 use of um, advanced uh, computational approaches, uh, um, deep learning based, um, and and there's certainly a lot of. I mean, there's a lot of hype now. It's like super hyped, um, but I think there's some real potential. Um, and certainly, I mean, we've seen that already the last 20, 30 years that. Um, Microscopy benefits from from not just having eyepieces, uh, but having a, a computer between the the between the objective and uh, and the experimenter, and using um, computational approaches to to process the data, analyze it, and and, and make sense of it. Yeah? So, the computational approach uh, will become more and more important as we have these high 
multi-dimensional data sets, space, time, dif different, different specificities and so on. Um, so there's this uh, idea of also smart microscopy where you have a real time feedback onto, onto your observations. Yeah, um, and that will be um, you know, data driven um, and certainly um, sort of an intelligent computer uh, interface uh, will, 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 will be uh, very important there. Yeah? Um, so I think that's, that will greatly facilitate things, uh, accelerate uh, our, our, um, our research. Um, and I think that's um, very excited about going into that direction more. And I, th I think the whole field will, will, will benefit from this. Yeah? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I hope uh, we can live and see even even more this kind of a general artificial intelligence maybe who knows mm -hmm. uh, and um yeah we can definitely advance and maybe make mm -hmm. a discoveries worth mm -hmm. nobel prize on a monthly mm -hmm. basis right mm -hmm. because of this kind of um help that we will get from the machine intelligence who mm -hmm. knows yeah. I, don't know. I mean we we need i think a lot of i mean it's if you look at uh, broadly in science um i mean we start the scientific age started I don't know when, I mean, 200 years ago, 300 years ago or something. Yeah. And then, um, and then a lot of, then sort of um, mankind, humankind f fell upon Wonderland. Yeah, there were always the doors open and there was a Schlaraffenland and there's all El Dorado, all this stuff they could, they could discover and, and very quickly. And then um, maybe it's a little bit depleted there with the tools at the time mm -hmm. yeah, that were available. And now we need to have new tools to sort of vault us to a new Schlaraffenland uh, mm -hmm. and we can make new discoveries. Um, but I think even within the, within the technologies that we have now, we can make so many discoveries. Yeah? Um, and that if we just apply our existing technology, there's so much biology that we can discover that's out there. Mm -hmm. It's unknown yet, needs to mm -hmm. be uncovered. And, and I think, yeah, big, big applications, again, uh, with computer-based approaches and then specifically in imaging um, is, a, a new wave of, um, of biosensors. Yeah? Um, I mean, that whole, the whole chemistry of biosensors has mm -hmm. only started to come into being in earnest last 10, 20 years. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And our whole, bio, whole chemistry departments have swung around to, um, to building smart molecules. They can, uh, they can be used as reporters, as sort of nano reporters. So they, their application will will deliver huge uh, results mm -hmm. in the coming years. Yeah. And if I may add something to the, this revolution kind of, of, uh, of tools development, etc., I think it's very important also that we kind of develop our way of thinking, right? Because mm -hmm. we see in many aspects of life, we have so, so advanced technologies and to deal with so many problems. However, our thinking is still the mm -hmm. same patterns. Mm -hmm. We go with the same problems. Uh, this is the nature, human nature, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Maybe if we start also developing mm. this kind of different thinking, mm. combined with new new technological mm. advancement, yeah, we, we have our intuition, mm -hmm. and we are bound to our intuitions. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and like in physics, there's this. Um, we still struggle with quantum physics, right? Uh, with the um, uh, entanglement and, and and all of that, the quantum effects, yeah, which uh, defy our our every everyday experience. Um, and and we probably need to also yeah if, you know for for understanding really how the brain works we probably need a new we have to leave our intuition behind and develop a new intuition yeah? and I think you know intuition just evolves yeah? and it will over no not over a generation but over generations yeah over a couple hundred years I think we probably will yeah <laughs> I totally agree I totally right. agree with that. Mm. All right. Uh, I think this is a great point to finish our discussion. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much once again for mm -hmm. coming and making mm -hmm. time for us. We appreciate it mm -hmm. a lot. Yeah, me too. Great. Thanks for having me.